rivers and coastal waters are important geographical features. But in time of war, they assume a special tactical importance, particularly when they happen to be in the combat zone. In some areas, such as deltas, where waterways are the only method of surface transportation, their tactical importance is much greater. And so it becomes essential to patrol, protect, and control all these critical waterways. To carry out this mission, the Navy has had to develop a small boat navy, made up of combat boats designed for riverine and inshore waters. One of these is the 50-foot ASPB, or Assault Support Patrol Boat, with its 20-millimeter cannon, 40-millimeter grenade launchers, and 50-caliber machine guns. These boats are designed to provide close support for troops operating in and around water areas. Another river boat is the ATC, or Armored Troop Carrier, which is equipped with 20 millimeter cannon, 40 millimeter grenade launchers, and 50 caliber machine guns as well. As its name suggests, the boat is designed to carry troops in and out of water areas. The 61-foot command and communications boat is also armed with cannon and grenade launchers. It's designed to serve as a mobile command and communications center. There are two versions of the heavily armed 60-foot monitor support boats. One carries a 105-millimeter howitzer. The other monitor is equipped with flamethrowers. And finally, there are the more lightly armed high-speed patrol boats. One is the 31-foot PBR river patrol boat. The other is the equally fast 50-foot PCF patrol craft, better known as the Swift boat. This film will limit itself to these two versatile and extensively used combat boats. The PBR, particularly, has proved to be a very useful riverboat. It has a fiberglass hull which, apart from being very strong, requires little care and is easy to repair. The boat is powered by twin diesel engines, each driving a water jet pump. The pumps take the place of the conventional propellers and rudders, giving the boat greater maneuverability. Without conventional propellers and rudders, the PBR is able to operate in very shallow water. The PBR is equipped with both radio and radar. The radar is a high-resolution, low-error, planned position indicator system. Uh, Red Rose, uh, this is uh, Happy Critic uh, Fox. The radio has a limited range, but it's a highly flexible two-way FM system. Great. I have. 
The boat has forward and aft machine gun mounts. The forward mount is normally equipped with two 50 caliber machine guns. The aft emplacement is usually equipped with one 50 caliber machine gun, which can be adapted to mount a 40 millimeter grenade launcher or a 60 millimeter mortar. Two M60 machine guns are mounted amidships. The PBR requires a cross-trained crew of four. A boat captain who runs the boat and operates the radio and radar. A gunner's mate to operate the forward guns. A seaman who operates the aft guns. And an engineer who takes care of the boat machinery and mans the midship machine guns. The PCF Fast Patrol or Swift Boat is a much larger boat than the PBR. In fact, large enough to provide sleeping and living quarters for a crew of six. The PCF has an aluminum hull and is driven by two diesel engines and twin screws. And in spite of its size and depth requirement, which is five feet, it's still a high-speed boat capable of about 25 knots or better. The swift boats are equipped with three radios, a radar, a fathometer, and a sound-powered phone between the pilot house, the radio area, and the two gun positions. A twin 50 caliber machine gun is mounted in a tub over the pilot house. And a single 50 caliber machine gun is mounted aft in combination with an 81 millimeter mortar. The PCF or Swift boat generally has an officer in charge and a cross train crew of five made up of a petty officer who is responsible for keeping the boat ship shape and who also operates the aft gun, an engineer who takes care of the boat's engines and machinery and helps the petty officer at the aft gun, a seaman who operates the twin 50 caliber guns over the pilot house, a radar man who operates the radar and carries ammunition for the different guns, and another seaman who drives the boat for the officer in charge, who is usually kept busy talking on the radio and directing the operation of the boat. The PCF is very simple to operate. The boat is steered by means of the wheel, while the engine control levers increase or decrease engine speed, and also control a head and a stern operation of the propellers. What is more demanding are the preparations the crew must make before operation, the checks they must make during operation, and the procedures they should follow in shutting down the engine. These are all covered in detail in the boat's operation and service manual. For example, before operation, the freshwater tank must be filled with drinking water. And the fuel tanks check to be sure they're full. You'll have to use a measuring rod on the aft tank. The fuel indicator will tell you if you need fuel in the forward tank. Also, sludge and water must be removed from each fuel tank. Make sure fuel return valves are open on the tank or tanks that are to be used. The seawater cooling system valves for the engines and the AC diesel generator must also be open. check the water level of the batteries. It's particularly important to go over the boat's engines before starting them up, checking the level of the engine oil and the coolant level. If they're low, they must be brought up to the correct level. The fuel strainers and filters must be checked. 
and if there's any sign of plugging, the elements must be changed. The oil level in the transmissions must also be checked and brought up to the proper level. The crankcase breather must be free of restrictions. The generator must also be prepared for operation, following the instructions given in the generator manual. The 24 volt direct current source of power switch in the engine room should be on and the alternating current source of power switch should be off. Engine room cowl vents should be clear. The primary and backup gun circuit main switches should be on. The lights, windshield wipers, and siren also have to be tested. And finally, you have to make sure that the engine control levers are in neutral. Once the pre-operation checks have been made, the propulsion engines can be started up. Hey, light off and let's get underway. Within 10 to 15 seconds, adequate pressure should be indicated on the oil pressure gauges. The engines are allowed to warm up without a load until the water temperature reaches 160 to 180 degrees. The generator should also be run at no load until the water temperature reaches 160 to 170 degrees. While engines and generators are running at operating temperatures, they should be checked for oil, fuel, and water leaks. To avoid the possibility of a flash of hot liquid, remove all tank caps slowly. The coolant level of both propulsion engines and generator should be checked again. When all these pre-operation checks have been made, the PCF is ready for operation. Okay, you guys, check out the engine, the pump, and the CO2. The PBR is also a simple boat to operate, but it requires the same careful preparation for operation. Its engines require the same checks as the PCF engines. However, since they have different engines, the boat's operation and service manual should be closely followed because they will indicate any special requirements, such as checking the jet pumps to make sure they're not clogged, and greasing the fitting on the drive shaft universal joint and the cable connection of the reverse gate. Most of the pre-operational requirements are simply preventive maintenance measures designed to protect the boats and their equipment. But very often they're also safety measures, which apply to conditions such as loading, which, if not done correctly, can seriously affect performance, wear out engines, and endanger the boat and everyone on it. When all the pre-operation checks have been made and everyone is clear of the machinery, the engine can be started and warmed up. During the operation of both the PBR and PCF, the indicators must be checked frequently to make sure the boats are running properly. And the engines and other machinery should be inspected periodically for leaks and other signs of failure or damage. crews should be familiar with emergency equipment and know what to do so they can respond quickly and effectively when there are failures or damage. For example, 
excessive bilge water on a PBR can be removed by using the water jet pumps. Small holes in the PBR hulls can be plugged temporarily by stuffing them with cotton duck. PCF damage control is more involved and requires a detailed knowledge of the boat's construction, stability, and other characteristics. Its engine-driven bilge pumps will drain flooded compartments. If they fail, there is also a hand-operated pump which has a limited pumping capacity. The PCF is also equipped with an emergency tiller that can be used when the steering system is badly damaged. Both the PBR and PCF can also be steered with the engine control lever. The stopping or shutting down procedures are similar for the PBR and PCF. The bilges should be dry before the engines are secured. And they should also be clean before they're reused. The PCF's bilge coating should be inspected to make sure it's in good condition and there are no signs of corrosion. The engines are idle for four or five minutes at half speed before they're secured. On the PCF, the generator also has to be turned off. The fuel tank should be filled at this time to reduce condensation. The engine oil is replenished if necessary. The seawater cooling suction valves are closed. Apart from the daily and weekly preventive maintenance required as part of operation, all other maintenance on PBR and PCF is performed by maintenance crews. But it's still the responsibility of the boat crew to see that it is done. Look, coming out, uh, your front seal is gone now. Looks like we're going to change your J-pump for you. Okay. How long will it take? Well, once we get to about a day, Periodically, on the basis of time, such as monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or hours used, all parts of the boats must be given more extensive maintenance. Exactly what and when it's required is indicated by PMS charts and cards, or the technical manuals for the boat. Some of the work can be performed by maintenance crews who bring parts and equipment right to the boats. But major maintenance work requires the extensive facilities of a maintenance yard, or repair shop, or barge. Here, hoists remove the boats from the water so that the hulls can be cleaned and repaired. Engines are overhauled or replaced. There are also special shops that overhaul or repair other boat equipment. Even an armament shop to take care of the boat's weapons. The PBR and PCF get a lot of maintenance, but they need it to meet the great demands placed upon them. Demands that come from missions such as their primary one of patrolling, frequently in hostile waters. I am preparing to uh, board and search. Over. Boarding and searching the vessels they encounter. They pick up and drop off foot patrols, often behind enemy lines, or support troops working near rivers or waterways. Sometimes they provide a blocking action to keep enemy troops from escaping across rivers or waterways.
They operate as waterborne guard posts, waiting to ambush enemy troops trying to cross rivers at night or take part in the medical civilian action patrol, bringing medical supplies and aid to remote or isolated villages. Their missions take them up waterways sometimes only a few inches deep. Off the coast, they work closely with patrolling aircraft and with the larger naval ships further out to sea. Under such conditions, it's hard to exaggerate the importance of maintenance. But no matter where they operate or what the mission, there's always the same demand for performance and reliability. And it's easy to see how these fast, tough little combat boats in only a few years, have been able to win a place alongside the much older and larger fighting ships of the Navy.